So we have a situation where you can see not only the collapse of the central banks, because you really need to hedge yourself out of the fiat currency system. And um, th there is only one thing to do, and that is to go for real money. What is legally money, and this is a point that everybody misses, legally money is only one thing, and that is metallic money in the form of gold and silver. Um, I would also add to it that uh, I'm sure that a lot of the people who you're getting calls from are worried about the values of assets as opposed to money, as opposed to the currency, as opposed to uh, the value of the deposits in the bank and whether they're, they're indeed safe. Um, because there is no doubt about it that with rising interest rates, you're going to get collapsing uh, financial asset values. And we're already seeing that, certainly. I mean, anyone who's got a portfolio of bonds and equities is sitting there wondering what the hell to do with it. Um, that, that, I'm afraid, is where they are. Uh, and uh, if they sell it, what, you know, what do they do? Um, do they just sit and cash in the bank? Um, that doesn't seem to be an, uh, an appealing alternative. I would actually say that the job of a central bank is to ensure that no commercial bank of any significance goes under. They, the mistake with Lehman was to ignore that fact. Um, so I would say that, um, I mean, part of the future that I see for us is that the banking system is in a state of collapse, but the central banks will rescue them. They must rescue them. They must move hell and high water in order to do so. That being so, then actually what we see is a debasement of the currency, because how do they do it? They have to make extra currency available to the banking system so that the banks can continue to survive. So, uh, I, you know, I think the key point at the moment, from my point of view, is that um, it is the asset values which are collapsing against a background of rising interest rates. That is the thing I think people need to understand. Uh, and uh, the point about this tussle between, um, you know, uh, should we continue to tighten uh, or are we heading a recession? A lot of that, I think, is driven by a fear um, of the effect of higher interest rates on asset prices. Um, uh, uh, and there is no doubt that um, we are on the, in the early stages. There's no doubt in my mind, we are in the early stages of a massive bear market, the likes of which we actually haven't seen, certainly since 1929 to 1932, and possibly ever. So from that point of view, um, yeah, I can understand people saying, where do I put my money? Now, the way I would look at it quite simply is, um, at the moment, those people are totally committed to the fiat money system. If we are looking at the collapse of the fiat money system, which in an effort to support the banking system becomes a dead certainty, this is the John Law theory, which I've been talking about on your show for oh, over a year now, um, then under those circumstances, you really need to hedge yourself out of the fiat currency system. And um, th there is only one thing to do, and that is to go for real money. What is legally money, and this is a point that everybody misses, legally money is only one thing, and that is metallic money in the form of gold and silver. So, you know, it's not a question of trying to run an investment portfolio where you would say, oh, you know, I've got to um, control my risk so that I won't put more than 10 percent of my funds, for example, in any one investment. And no, that's not the way to look at it. The way to look at it is you are totally invested in fiat. If fiat collapses, you lose everything. The answer basically is to hedge out of that. You're going to see um, falls and rises in commodity prices. Um, I mean, I would expect the price of oil uh, initially to double. But uh, in getting there, it's not necessarily going to do it in a straight line. Uh, so, uh, but I think as things go on, as, as uh, people begin to understand that this is um, the collapse of uh, the fiat currency system, then I think you'll find that it's, it becomes a lot more sudden and nasty. And it can be overnight. I mean, I don't know. Um, you have got um, 
instant financial um, communication. Uh, and um, so this is something that could happen suddenly very, very quickly. I mean, as a parallel, I do remember um, there was a moment in the Lehman uh, crisis where I thought, and I think everyone else thought, how are they going to get out of this one? You know, we were really staring into the abyss. Um, and when you're staring into the abyss, you need a miracle. <laughs> and that's it. And if the miracle doesn't arrive, then you are in the abyss. And so things can happen very, very quickly. I'm not saying they necessarily will, because I honestly don't know how it will plan out. That's, you know, that's something that um, <laughs> we will know at the time. But all I can say is that... Um, uh, you know, while people don't understand what's going on and while the situation continues, um, then uh, you are bound to get um, uh, movement in both directions. But I think that the collapse in um, uh, financial assets and the whole of the financial uh, system is um, – very much uh, what we have in prospect. I mean, I'll give you an example. It was revealed, I think Reuters um, had a comment that um, the losses on the Fed's balance sheet were something like $380 billion, something like that, whereas the Fed's capital is something like $35 billion. I mean, I don't know that I've got those figures exactly right, but it is quite clear that from the losses on of the bond portfolio, on the Fed's balance sheet as a result of QE. And remember, um, in the past, central banks didn't do QE. So this is a new thing that we're seeing. Basically, it's wiped out the Fed's capital. What's the Fed going to do about it? I mean, I know how the Fed can recapitalize, but as we go through the the uh, process, this is hardly likely to engender an awful lot of confidence in the Fed. Now, if you think the Fed's got a problem, which you know, has now been effectively admitted in public, then um, for goodness sake, uh, just have a look at what's going on with the ECB. The ECB is in exactly the same situation. I would say that one of the differences is that the ECB is invested in longer term debt on average than um, uh, the Fed. I would also say that a lot of the debt the ECB is invested in is more volatile than U.S. Treasuries, for example, Italian uh, 10-year bonds, Italian 20-year bonds, Spanish bonds, and so on and so forth. Um, and worse than that, all the, all the ECB's shareholders, to it, the national central banks in the euro system, they also have the same problem. Um, they have negative equity. So the whole of the euro system, at some stage, is going to have to be recapitalized. And then we turn to um, our friends in Japan. It's exactly the same problem there. They have, but I mean, they've been doing QE since the year 2000. And um, they have accumulated huge amounts of um, bonds. They've even got equities and ETFs on um, the Bank of Japan's uh, balance sheet. And um, you know, that, um, I mean, it can be recapitalized, but this is this is a situation where both um, if you look at both Japan and the the, uh, the uh, eurozone, the major global systemically important banks, the GSIBs, uh, are all uh, with um, asset to equity ratios of over twenty times. I mean, you know, they are so highly geared. So we have a situation where you can see not only the collapse of the central banks and the need for them to be recapitalized. And this being particularly difficult in the case of uh, the Eurozone or the Euro system, but at the same time, the underlying banking systems are likely to need rescuing. Where do we go with that? And this is why I've maintained um, for a long time that the way this is evolving is, is the equivalent of the John Law situation, where basically John Law printed money because he was controller of the currency, as well as running the prototype central bank, the Banque Royale. And he was financing both the Banque Royale and also his Mississippi Ventures, which was a monopoly on France's imports and exports. Um, he needed to build ships um, in, order, in order to do this business. He needed to raise funds. He did it by printing money. It all went into a bubble. Um, and the bubble started imploding. He had to accelerate the printing of money. He destroyed the currency. 
The um, uh, the Mississippi venture in its various guises actually continued uh, for some time after that, and uh, we eventually chucked them out of India where, where they were operating. Um, and that I think was something like 60 years later. So. Um, what actually collapses in this situation is the currency, and that is the lesson that we had from the John Law situation. Now, John Law was only one country, and that was France. Nowadays, every central bank follows exactly the same policies, and they all meet at the Bank of International Settlements and coordinate their policies. So there's no escape from this in the Western world. And it's interesting that uh, both China and Russia have um, decided to do what I've just recommended, you know, get the hell out of um, the Western fiat currency system. And they're trying to find a way of backing their currencies, uh, which um, can't be interfered with by, uh, by America and her allies. And they, what they're doing is they're commoditizing their currencies. They're tying their currencies to commodities. Um, and uh, Russia has done this with... Um, uh, you know, the oil for rubles. Uh, and uh, what's happened, the best performing currency in the world this year after halving uh, is the ruble. It's currently at just under 60 to the dollar, having been as low as 150 to the dollar. So, um, you know, this the world is, is, is separating out on geopolitical lines when it comes to currencies. Um, China is yet to grasp the currency nettle, and at the moment she's got a problem. She's got, um, well, you know, self-inflicted problems on COVID lockdowns continuing, and at the same time she's got a property crisis developing, which she's trying to control. So the situation in China is not the best, but China at least is in the situation and she doesn't have to spend an awful lot of money on welfare for her citizens. Uh, so she could probably go through a major, major depression, um, such as we saw in the 1930s and come out the other side. Uh, whereas there's no way we can. Nobody in the West has the political mandate to um, uh, just sort of stand back and let everything fall apart. So. Uh, and that's the only way, really, at the end of the day, that the currency can be protected. In other words, uh, the Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and all the rest of them just have, you know, I mean, the only option they've got, really, um, is to turn around and say, right, no more money printing. That's it. We're going to stop the expansion of bank credit as well. And if anybody goes under, tough. I think that the likelihood of that happening is, I don't know, it's like a snowball in hell's chance.